You rolling? I'm honored to be interviewed by Alex Jones, a truth seeker, fighting for justice in America. Now he's charming me. He's getting me all smiling. <laughs> Aaron, when did you start to think something was wrong in the world or start to find out about the whole banking cartel and the Federal Reserve System, the, the New World Order? Well, that, that was a, a progression of events. Uh, I became very, I'm, I've always been a very independent person, always believed in individuality, and that we were put on this earth to be uh, unique individuals to fulfill our God-given potential, and that uh, the only way to fulfill your potential is to be free, to find out who you are, and to make your errors, to make mistakes. And as I, as, uh, I grew up, I began to realize more and more the government was inhibiting me in things that I wanted to do. And uh, what happened, uh, I was very successful in the ladies' lingerie business. I worked for my dad. He had a small undergarment business. And I created the first ladies' bikini panties back in 1963, actually. And then I opened up a, um, a nightclub in Chicago called the Electric Theater uh, that, that opened up the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. Wow. All right, and so the city of Chicago was in flames the day my club opened, wow. and nobody came out to the club. And um, well, what happened was that um, uh, that was the year of the Democratic Convention in Chicago in '68, and so my club became a hangout for the hippies, you know, and because they, they wanted to go to Chicago and protest what was going on. And I was having a concert at my club one night to raise money. And uh, the police uh, raided the nightclub, my club for no reason at all. And uh, I was standing outside my, in my office looking overlooking the street, and I saw all these paddy wagons pulling up in front of my club. And I was a 24-year-old kid. You know, I had no experience at all, really. I said, what are these paddy wagons doing here? And then I saw all these cops getting out of the paddy wagons coming into my club. I said, oh my God, they're raiding me. And so uh, I ran down to the stage, and I got on the stage, and I stopped the band from playing. And I said to the people in the audience, we're being raided, you know, so uh, sit down on the floor, cooperate, you know, you know, and uh, uh, plot your identification and cooperate with the police. And as I said that, uh, two of the cops from behind threw me onto the floor and grabbed me and, and started dragging me out of the club. Uh, and uh, I'm going, you know, victory, victory, you know, playing it for all it was worth at the time. I was a kid, and, uh, uh, and then I saw the fire department there, and the fire department was dumping garbage cans, the garbage, all over the floor. And I thought to myself, well, why are they doing that, you know, very quickly as, I was as they were dragging me out? And I didn't quite understand it. So they threw me into the paddy wagon. As I got into the paddy wagon, one of the cops grabbed my testicles from behind and squeezed and I went to the paddy wagon in gigantic pain. And uh, the next person that came into the paddy wagon, the cop, as he was stepping in, the cops took the billy club, smashed him on the head with it, and just split his skull, you know, for no reason. I mean, there was nothing wrong. So that was kind of your wake up. That was my awakening. It's like, what is going on? Well, I, I thought this was America. So I, I initially blamed it on Chicago and Mayor Daly, think it was just that it was, it was Chicago. And anyway, I went on the, I went, it was the headlines of the newspapers the next day. You know, there was my picture in the newspapers, the headlines, electric theater short-circuited, it was raided. And in the article, uh, they went ahead and they said that uh, the reason they raided the club was because the fire department came there and saw it was messy full of garbage, and the hippies started attacking them, which was totally not true. Those dirty hippies? It was, yeah, it was totally false. You know, it was, it was a complete fabrication. So they ran a false flag on you? They framed yeah. you? Yeah, they, of course. You know, and uh, I was in shock. I said, people lie like that? People actually do these things? I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, it was an awakening to me. And I went on television, I told people on television that they lied. Nobody cared. Nobody cared what the truth was. You know, it was shocking to me. Um, and then a, 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 week or, a week or two weeks later, I forget exactly what it was, uh, two, two cops come to see me, a lieutenant and a, and a sergeant, uh, a captain and a sergeant. Mm. And they said, Mr. Russo, we're sorry if you got hurt that night at the club and the raid, but uh, we're here to tell you that if you want to keep the club open, it's going to take uh, $2,000 a month, and we're going to come see you once a month, and whenever we have to raid you, we're going to call you, 
you know, and we'll let you know we're going to come in tonight and raid you. This was mafia. Uh, well, the police mafia. Yeah. You know, and uh, actually, it was actually actually more interesting than that they said, listen, there's the A plan, there's the B plan, and there's the super deluxe plan. And this one, of course, each one, of course, that much money a month. Which one do you want? What was I, the super deluxe? That's the one I took. That was a two thousand a month plan. And I took that plan, and um, I paid them $2,000 a month, and they left me alone. And whenever they were going to raid the club, they would come there, we were going to raid, we are going to have a phony raid tonight, you know, just to look good for the people in the neighborhood, you know. So that was your first big education. That was my education into corruption in government, you know. But I really thought that was basically Chicago. I didn't realize it was the whole country was like that. And so that was my wake-up call, that people lie and cheat and steal. And uh, I thought everybody was always honest and nice and decent, and uh, I had no idea about any of these things. Finally, one day they came to me, and they said, look, we, we, we can't take your money anymore. I said, why, what's up? What's going on? I said, we have to close your club. This election's coming, and the aldermen and the neighbor don't want you open anymore. So we can't take your money. So I had to go to court and fight them, and they were trying to close the club. And then one night there was a fire, and the club never reopened again. It was, they, the club just closed. and. That was the end of the club, and they, they, they burned me down. And that, that was the end of my experience. And then I moved back to New York, where I met Bette Midler, and uh, I uh, ran into her at a little uh, nightclub she was playing called The Improv, and I thought she was fabulous. And through a series of events, I began managing her. And as soon as I started managing her, her career took off like a rocket. You know, it was just for, fortuitous, I guess. And. Um, uh, we became very, very successful, and through managing Bet, I started producing shows on Broadway where I won the Tony, and I produced a television show where I won the Emmy with Dustin Hoffman and Bet, you know, and then uh, I produced The Rose for her, where she got Academy Award nominations, wow. and then that led me to producing Trading Places, which everybody knows. You know, I think it's the best Eddie Murphy movie. Well, it's a good one. I don't know if it's the best, but it's a really good one, and I'm very proud I made that movie. And so, in, in, in my mind, um, I feel as if I've made a classic comedy in Trading Places, a classic musical in The Rose, and a classic documentary in Freedom to Fascism. You know, so I'm very proud of my work that I've done as a filmmaker. Back in, uh, in the late 80s, I was a pretty big silver trader and gold trader. And uh, I don't think I've ever told this story on tape before. Uh, I was a pretty big silver and gold trader, and um, the uh, I took and I always paid my taxes, and I took what was a legal tax deduction on my silver trades, and uh, a few years later, I think it was '88 or '89 or something, the uh, IRS claimed that what I did and other people did as well was now illegal. We couldn't do it anymore, but they made it retroactive. I said, what do you mean retroactive? It was legal then, we did, I did what was legal. He said, yeah, but it's now we're making it illegal retroactively. And you, it, that's not good, so you owe us six hundred or $800,000. For what? It was legal, how could you make something retroactive? Change the law backwards in time. It makes no sense. Well, we're doing it. And so everybody said they can't do that, so we went to court, a class action lawsuit. And the judge agreed with the IRS and said so they could do it retroactively. And that's when I knew that there was something wrong in America with the IRS and the system here, you yeah. know. Aaron, you were telling me this story last night, uh, and before you even finished saying, in the late 80s, the tax law, I said retroactive. And I knew that because they literally ruined my dad, but, but he paid. He, he didn't know, he still thought this was America. And uh, it, w it was legal tax law, what you're supposed to do. And they said retroactively you owe, and with, not just retroactive, but they said you also have penalties and interest. That's right. So how do you have penalties and interest on something when they retroactively change the law? Well, first of all, you can't retroactively be, how can you, how can you do something retroactively? Penalties and interest are a farce. The whole thing, because they do whatever they want to do. And that's when I realized America is not America. It's not the land that I was taught it was. Because they can do whatever they wish to do. And there's nothing the citizen can do about it. Now, you've made America Freedom of Fascism.